Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Anton Protapopov from Isovalent. And yeah, let's talk about how to do packet classification using BPF. And in fact, using one single map in BPF. So uh, we will look at uh, different algorithms which can be used for online packet classifications. And then uh, I will review the API of this new map and show some numbers uh, to so that people can see how it works, how it fits inside the PPF. So packet classification in general, we have a set of rules, then we have a stream of packets and we need to match uh, common packets with rules. And rule can be as just simple like we filter by source address or source prefix or a port range, or it can be a combined rule where we have several fields inside packet and we want to match all of them, like four or five tuple or something else. And uh, of course, a requirement is that we have fast lookups as fast as possible because we have a stream of packets. And online packet classification, uh, like in white papers, uh, it's the same, but it also requires fast updates so that updates can be made not by operator typing things, but just by robot. So use cases for packet filtering are pretty like obvious and generic. So software defined networks, uh, any kind of firewalling, uh, routing decisions, etc. In Silum, we have uh, at least three use cases, which fits uh, well with this map. One is the Silum XDP per filter. It's a simple DDoS mitigation mechanism. Right now, uh, it supports filtering packets either by source address or by source seeder. And in the first case, a hash is used. In the second case, uh, an LPM tree is used. and um, New map actually tends to work faster than LPM, so we can like, pretty simple optimize Silum with this new map. Also, we can let users to specify more sophisticated uh, rules if they want, because when they provide configuration, we can just set up a new map with different configuration. They can filter uh, using not only source address, but other fields as well. The second example is uh, a packet recorder for our standalone load balancer. Uh, there was a talk last year uh, by Daniel and Martins uh, about um, the packet recorder. It supports, kind of supports wildcard for tuples, but actually doesn't because uh, we do not support port ranges. And um, sometimes when you update map with a new value, it requires a recompilation of programs. So. It is not an online algorithm. It can take seconds uh, to, to set up a new rule or to delete a rule from a table. Another example from Silum world is uh, Kubernetes and Silum network policies. Uh, Silum provides container networking interface for Kubernetes and the latest Kubernetes version um, made port ranges, uh, the standard feature. This means we need to support it and we currently don't. We kind of can implement this using LPM, but LPM again, is a little bit slower than this hash. And also we can't implement real ranges with LPM. We can uh, implement prefixes, but not ranges. So what is like design decisions for this new map? It, it should support easy configuration between different uh, rule structures. Even in Silum cases, we have three different rule structures. In the first case, we filtered like source prefixes. In the second, the four tuple. And for Kubernetes networking polis, we actually do, we have a security ID plus a port range. So it's two field uh, map. It obviously needs to support fast lookups and uh, fast updates as fast as possible. And one thing is that uh, complexity. For Cilium, complexity 
is a concern because we have different way, way different configurations uh, running on different servers. They support different kernels and uh, the solution should be as simple as possible. And in case of map, the complexity is as simple as possible because to insert a rule, you just do a BPF map update. And for matching packets, you just do BPF element lookup. So what are algorithms which can be used for packet filtering in general? So the, the simplest one is brute force. You just take a list of rules and then you match them one by one. And this obviously doesn't scale to more than, I don't know, eight, 16 rules. So there are other two family of algorithms which uh, solve this problem uh, to be scale, scale, scalable. One is hash-based, uh, the other is tree-based. Obviously, hash-based provides something like constant time lookups and tree-based logarithm time lookups. And uh, the, the basic idea between all these algorithms uh, is the same. You take a huge set of rules, you split them into several uh, buckets uh, or tables, it's called tables in most times, and then you do brute force on top of tables. So for each table, you do a lookup. If if it matched, then okay. If not, then you go to next table. So let's took look at uh, times which this algorithm provides. Uh, I took this picture from the tuple merge uh, white paper. And uh, here we see several algorithms. The tuple space search on the right, uh, it's used in OVS and it's um, hash-based, uh, the original one hash-based algorithm. The partition sort is tree-based algorithm. The previous state-of-art algorithm, the tuple merge is the new state-of-art al algorithm, which uh, works faster in both lookup and update times than partition sort. And on top, you can see the smart split. Uh, so from this table, it's seen that uh, it, its classification time is the fastest, but its update time can take seconds. So it's not uh, actually a solution. So let's look more precisely at how um, hash-based algorithms work. Uh, I didn't implement and didn't try to implement the partition sort the tree-based one because uh, lookup time is logarithmic versus constant and also tuple merge white paper shows that uh, it, it is slow by both lookup and update time. Um, so let's look at hash-based algorithms. The tuple space search is the simplest one. So we have a set of rules. Uh, in this case, we will just filter by source address for simplicity, one field. And um, the tuple space search uh, joins rules and tables by the length of the prefix. So here we have two slash 16 rules, one slash eight rules, two slash 24 rules, and we combine them into three tables, one with slash 16 prefix, another with slash eight, and another with slash 24. So when packet arrives, say 10 to 2 to 2, uh, we need to look up every table uh, and first we go to the first table. The first table has a prefix 16. This means that to look up this packet, we apply a mask of 16 bits. And we get this value and we see that it doesn't belong to this table. So we go to the next table. Here we have a prefix slash 8. So we apply a mask of only 8 bits. We got this value, it doesn't belong to this table. So we go to the next table. Here we applied mask of 24 bits and voila, we found the packet inside this table. So this is a match. So what is the problem with tuple space search? So it's not a problem with tuple space search, it's for all this algorithm, but in tuple space search, it's pretty obvious. Like to do a successful lookup, we need to you know, look up about half of tables. Uh, to do unsuccessful lookup, meaning that package packet doesn't match. We need to look up and all the tables. And uh, even in this case, with one prefix for IPv4, we can have something like 33 tables. If we go to two fields, here is an example for source and destination addresses. 
uh, we can see that uh, the number of tables uh, grows too fast. So here um, on the horizontal axis, we have number of rules and on the vertical, we have a number of tables. And we can see that even for 100 uh, random rules, the number of tables is already like about 50, 60. And this means that even for 100 rules, we will do about like 30 hash lookups per packet. This is too slow. And uh, for IPv6, it gets worse because we have more randomness, we have more and more different prefixes. And here, for example, at uh, about 10,000, so 20,000 20, rules, we kept at um, 4,000 tables, uh, which is which doesn't work in production at all. So the tuple merge algorithm solves this using several optimizations to tuple search space, tuple space eh, search. So um, first idea is that if we have a particular uh, table with particular prefix, we can make, we can put their rules which has uh, greater prefix. For example, if we have table slash 16, we can put slash 16 rules there, we can put slash 17 rules there, we can put slash 24 rules. If another rule uh, appears like slash eight, then we can't put it inside this table, we create a new table. And only this uh, optimization dramatically reduces the number of tables. So this is the same um, experiment with the number of tables for tuple space search. And below you see the line almost line for the tuple merge. Uh, for IPv6, it is really undistinguishable from straight line here. The second idea which uh, can reduce the number of tables is that when we got a new rule, uh, which doesn't belong to any table, we don't take a prefix as is, we just trim it a little bit. So for longer prefixes, we remove a little bit more rule uh, bits. Uh, for shorter, we remove a little less. Uh, bits, but in general, if we have like, for example, slash 16, we create table not slash 16, but slash 14. So slash 16 rules would fit there, slash 15 and slash 14 will fit there. If we see a slash 13 rule, then we will create a new table. This also reduces the number of table. Uh, is it, this is the same example. So on top, you see the number of tables for untrimmed tuple merge version. And below you can see that uh, if we trim tables, the number of tables uh, reduce it like twice for IPv4 and uh, even more for IPv6 because we had like, more randomness here. So the third idea, uh, which was used in um, tuple merge white paper, uh, and it, it is not applicable to the generic uh, implementation, luckily. So if we have two fields which differ a lot, like Example, we have 24 prefix and, tw and 8 prefix. So we can just uh, omit the 8 prefix because it doesn't provide uh, a lot of randomness in, in any way. So, but it is not applicable in, gen in generic case because in Tuple uh, Merge uh, white paper, uh, they filter uh, four tuples and we have source and destination IP addresses. So we can distinguish, like choose between them. But in general case, uh, we don't know in advance what field means at all. So we can't simply like compare them and decide which to omit and which provides more randomness in general case. So other problems with tuple merge? Yes, there are some problems. Namely, we can't guarantee the number of tables in advance. Uh, this means like, for example, that for if, if we want to pre-allocate map, then we need to prolocate way more tables than uh, is required, actually. And even in this case, we are not 100% guaranteed that we will have enough memory. But um, another thing is that the number of tables depends on uh, the order in which rules appear. So here's a simple example. We first have uh, slash eight rule, then we create a table of prefix seven then we see a slash 16 rule and it fits inside this table. But if the slash 16 rule appears first, uh, then we will create a slash 14 table. And then when slash eight rule 
appears, we have to create a new table because it doesn't fit in the smallest one. So the order of rules in this small example uh, means a lot. Like uh, the second example will be twice slower than the first one. And uh, when we have a lot of rules, it doesn't like scale exponentially, but um, it is it is random. So we can fix this by um, pre-allocating tables uh, for a particular map. Uh, in this example, we have uh, IPv6 four tuples, and say we know that no rule will appear with prefix shorter than 32. Then we can just create a 32, 32 table, and all the rules will fit inside this table. We still will have 64 bits of randomness, which is uh, enough for hashing. And if we want, for example, to ignore source or destination, we can create not one, but three tables. Uh, and most of rules will still be in, in the first one. So for lookups, it won't slow anything down. So a problem with this is that, um, yeah, it's custom tone. So if we created a map for a huge system and said, yeah, there will be only 32, 32 rules, but then two months later, we decided that we need to support 30 slash 30 rules, then it doesn't work. We either need to break them or to reboot the thing. It, it, it is, of course, uh, doable, but uh, uh, not, not very convenient. Uh, another thing which is way more inconvenient is that if we provide API to do something, the users will find a way how to use it wrong and will have more bug reports and uh, maintenance sub, like burden. So which algorithm to use for this map? Uh, so first, the idea was to do all the things, like to support algorithm brute force and support algorithm tuple merge, and then provide a flag to 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 do additional configuration for tuple merge to do like, to allocate static tables, and this is what I sent in the first RFC. But actually, this is not like too too good. It's better to to provide less less API and uh, probably the, the, the next uh, step will be to provide just a generic algorithm without this additional configuration. If there will appear a better algorithm, we will just replace implementation. So the API doesn't change. And another thing uh, which Stanislav mentioned is that um, in future, we, we will be able to implement such classifiers using BPF itself. So it will be possible to just create a map uh, load the BPF program and then say that this map will be classified using this particular program, which provides like a lot of flexibility and reduces like maintenance burden from us because all decisions were are made by users. So let's look at an example. Um, again, the, the example is uh, pretty simple. We will filter four tuples source uh, an IP destination addresses IPv4 by uh, prefix, and then we will have source and destination port ranges. So this is how we uh, define a map. It has type BPF type wildcard, and uh, here we choose the a particular algorithm, uh, which can be omitted in, in future patches. So, this is pretty simple, like this is map description, the, the field structure description, which we use here, uh, we will review it shortly. And to use this map, it's also straightforward. Here we create a rule, so it's uh, source address and its prefix, it's destination address and its prefix, it's port range and destination port range, and then we just do BPF map update. To look up packets, it's even simpler. We need to copy less fields. So we just copy source address, destination address. We copy both ports. And uh, we just look up element inside map. So let's look at um, how we define a particular rule structure. So for this map, we say we have four fields. Uh, the, the structure will be called capture4 wildcard. And we have 
uh, like description of fields themselves. The first field is prefix, it's uh, four bytes. And the second is also prefix, it's also four bytes for the destination address. And we have two 16-bit uh, ranges for source and destination ports. Uh, this name uh, is used uh, to, to specify the structure names in map definitions. So the first one is struct key. It is defined by this macro. We don't need to define anything else. And the second one is uh, a new field in the BTF map definition called wildcard descriptor. And uh, it is required to tell kernel how to interpret uh, the key because kernel sees only void pointer and size. The key itself looks like this. So we have a structure, it has type, it is either rule or element. In, in case of rule, we use this part of union. In case of element or packet, it's names are hard. We use the second uh, part of structure and they look like this. So for packet, it's pretty simple. It serves destination address port and destination port. And for rule, we have more data. How they match uh, like this. So we have source address in a packet. We go to the rule, we have source address and prefix. We have destination address, we have destination address and prefix. So we can match them. For ranges, we have a name here and minimum and maximum value in uh, the rule. Again, name here, minimum and maximum value here. So as I mentioned, kernel only sees uh, void key and key size. So we need to tell kernel how to process the, the packets. And uh, it is done by passing uh, this structure in BPF attributes. So we have number of rules and for each individual rule, we have a, uh, another structure which describes the rule. It's also pretty simple, it's just type and size. So uh, prefix, range, and size. So in, for our photopool uh, case, we have four rules and we have four field descriptors. The first one is prefix of size four, uh, four bytes. Another is prefix with also four bytes and two ranges of 16 bits. So there is a one problem. We can't specify the structure in BTF definition because BTF uh, can't uh, get the structures. So we need to actually macro defines another structure, which is parsable, uh, which is understandable by BTF. And then libbpf takes the structure and translates it to the structure which kernel will understand. So we take uh, number of rules here, we just convert it to integer. Then we take the first field called source address and we convert it to prefix and size and so on. So again, uh, for for users, like for users of this map, it doesn't matter all, all this machinery because we just define the simple structure. Then we just pass uh, this name in the key and well, wildcard descriptor without like any uh, uh, problem. So what kernel changes required to do this besides implementing the map? Uh, another piece of data needs to be added to BPF attributes. So on map create, we copy another piece of data which contains this wildcard descriptor. And of course, libbpf needs to parse uh, the BTF description to the description which is understandable by kernel. And that's it, no, no extra changes. So let's look at numbers. Uh, here we, we see four tuple IPv4 uh, case and uh, rules, we have a number of rules like for, from 100 to 100 thousands. So the scale is logarithmic. And the blue one is the generic uh, tuple merge. We see that it jumps up and down because we don't know in advance the number of tables. The, the orange one is uh, a static tuple merge when we allocated four tables. And the green one is the static tuple merge when we allocated just two tables uh, for IPv4. And we see that like if, if you have less tables, we have faster lookups. But even in generic case, uh, Again, this is uh, the, the right side is for like 100,000 rules. So we still are un under like 
or at like 120 nanoseconds, which is pretty good. For unsuccessful lookups, uh, the numbers are more or less the same, but we see that like for unsuccessful lookup, we'll look up twice more tables, so numbers are twice bigger. But and we see that penalty for having more tables is greater for unsuccessful lookups. This is the same numbers uh, for IPv6 case. The only thing which differs here is that the static table uh, below has only one table. So we actually do only one hash lookup for IPv6. And also one thing to mention, unluckily I don't have uh, numbers here on this plot, but uh, like the generic uh, hash, if you just hash two IPv6 addresses, it uh, it looks like to be a little bit slower than uh, this static tuple merge because in, in tuple merge we only use 64 bits versus 256. This is unsuccessful lookups for IPv6. And another uh, slide with numbers is that uh, for simple case when we just filter one prefix, uh, this map, even if it's generic form without like static allocation, it works faster than uh, LPM tree. Uh, and if we like grow number of rules, uh, it seems that it also like tends to grow less because LPM is logarithmic, we are constant. So for Cilium cases, for example, we can just replace uh, LPM with this new map and we'll just benefit from speed here. This is uh, updates for the LPM and tuple merge. Again, we can see that th there is a difference so this is almost it, uh, almost fit in time. So this is the the picture uh, from this tuple merge uh, white paper, and you see this trade-off line and unfeasible region. So now it looks like this: uh, the kernel implementation of tuple merge uh, is <laughs> in the unfeasible region. Of course, this means that we need to draw trade-off line in a different place, but still. Uh, and also I, I want to mention like here is like half of mi mi microsecond for an update. Uh, even for um, not pre-allocated maps, we have a better number. So I just didn't want to move it here. So for pre-allocated maps, we will have numbers like uh, 100 nanoseconds for updates and 100 nanoseconds for lookups, uh, which, which is actually pretty good. And for, again, this is for big number of rules. If we have thousands of rules, not hundred thousands, it's even faster. So that's it. Please uh, send your use cases for packet filtering so we can uh, refine the user API and do the, like the, the minimum user API visible. And thanks for listening. Many thanks for sharing. Uh, I have two questions about this uh, solution. The first one uh, question will be, is there any uh, rules uh, numbers up limit by this solution? The the limit on number of rules? Yes, yes. Uh, no, like uh, you can define any number of rules, of course. Um, like it's it will slow down the lookups because you will have to um, process more like loop iterations. We have a generic match function. And another thing is that uh, in, in this case, for example, for four tuples, uh, we can just ignore port ranges. So the number of tables depends on like source and destination IP addresses, but the fields uh, with port ranges do not like add any new tables. If you have 10 fields, each of them, each of fields is uh, like important and you can't ignore this, then uh, the possible number of tables can grow like exponentially by number of fields. So you, you need to refine which, which fields can be ignored in this case. So for, for port ranges, it's a general thing that uh, in such algorithms, port ranges are ignored. And so if we has have uh, like hash collision, which brings us to like several port ranges. We just solve it as, as a usual hash map.
Thank you. Uh, the second question actually is for production environment. You know, it's not just about the latency uh, for the you know rules, uh, also about the memory usage, right? So, if if you have any data for the you know uh, memory use, usage for this solution, for example, how much how how many memory you will uh, will cost? Yeah. So uh, this costs exactly like a normal hash. So you just have a hash table. Uh, we use only one hash table per all tables and uh, we allocate buckets of course for a hash table but otherwise it's it is the same uh, for one example for in, in your uh, experiment i saw the four, uh, 400 thousand rules so given the rpm solution so how many memory will cost roughly remember um i i didn't mem remember i didn't measure the the memory like precisely but uh for hash table uh like if you have a hundred thousand rules right you will create a hash table with a hundred thousand uh buckets as as we do like for a hash we can uh, like right now it is done like this and it is done like the hash map uh like normal hash map uh in my like Early experiments, I did uh, allocate less buckets than the number of rules. And of course, in this case, we have more collisions. But um, again, like we can allocate like four, eight times less back buckets than rules. But uh, this will, of course, impact the, um, the collisions, the lookup time. OK, thank you. Hello, my name is Lawrence. Can you go back to the slide where you talk about changes to BPF uh, map create? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, that's yep. one more. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. So here the extra data is like a, a sized buffer. Can you tell me what's in there? Is that like BTF wire format? Yeah, of course. And so. The, this uh, buffer contains this the second structure, uh, struct well carved desk. And it, it just contains uh, here, second. Yeah, here it is. So in this case, we will pass this structure. So four rules, and then we have the, an array of rules here, an array of descriptors. So we have a generic match function. It, it goes to the first rule. It takes a look here and says, uh -huh, prefix, it's size four and such so this one yeah so my my kind of follow-up question is for other uh, parts of the api where we specify types via btf we usually take a file descriptor for a btf object and like an id in that uh, file descriptor so here you've kind of gone with take a raw btf uh buffer i guess um like is there a specific reason you did it that way versus uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for um, it, it is possible to create a map without using BTF, right? So just use a BPF call. So in this case, uh, like this is like less meaningful. But of course, yeah, we can just say where we are. Uh, we, we can just pass uh, create create BTF ourselves and pass the BTF object here okay. uh, slides. Okay. yeah so so yeah so instead of doing this we can pass a btf id cool. thanks hey anton uh not surprising to see you working on this i know you've thought about it for a long time did you consider leveraging any of the, the routing layer implementation since it's already doing an LPM type match? So it already has like optimized trees for insert, delete, lookups, that kind of stuff, and trying to reuse that for this. Um, no. So I didn't have like, <laughs> sorry, I didn't have much time to, to work on this actually. So uh, I just wanted to implement like Topper merge in, in form of BPF map uh and only considered our silly on use cases yet so okay because it has well-known you know understood properties in terms of it's been highly optimized in terms of lookups and the insert it knows we know the memory aspects of it so anyway something to consider if it could be extended for this absolutely 
Thanks. Yeah, I think to add. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so my, my initial comment was I would just like to appreciate the fact that we just heard from Daniel how BPF is now no longer semantically a classifier. And now we have a talk about adding a classifier that can be used from BPF. Um, and I'm sure we'll come full circle a couple of times. So um, in terms of the UAPI, when I saw the patch series, I was, um, uh, it, it was a little bit inscrutable. This helped a lot to explain. I think it would be useful to uh, separate out the BTF format for um, for defining this and the actual UAPI to the kernel, as uh, Lawrence was also saying. Um, also, because we have uh, user space libraries that are not C and BTF based, so having this um, defining and it, that documenting the structs format for actually passing the definition to the kernel separately would be useful for understanding how this works. Uh, and also, I fear a little bit that this is like something that will lead to another uh, E in val hell when you're trying to debug why your definition is not working. Um, and I'm yeah, not sure this, is, this is why I defined this uh, like macro <laughs> to provide such a descriptions. And uh, so, I don't know, if, if you look at the slides, like the user API is pretty simple, right? It's five lines, extra lines, uh, comparing to a normal map definition. So users shouldn't think about this at, like at all. Well, as, as long as they just need, want to do a normal fortable uh, match, yes, that's simple for a certain definition of simple. Um, but <laughs> once you want to do weird things with this and, and try to change it, the kernel is just either it's just going to accept it and your matches will be wrong, uh, or it's going to give you back an eval if the format doesn't match, and and this will, like, this is the kind of thing that confuses users, right? If you, so yeah, for, for for this actually while developing this map, I also was thinking about eval because I had like of course during development some bugs and uh, uh, I had a lot of invals, so. I was actually like thinking about doing something like verifier does. Uh, like if if my map update failed, I would just pass another map update with a log buffer to do this. It will be slow, but I just if I need to know the reason, then I can just use like a, a second like maybe statically linked version of BPF map update, which does the same but provides some insights of what's went wrong. Yeah, so like we just heard about Netlink and it xed act and it's pointers to which bits are wrong and something. I feel like we are in the way of, re of reinventing that. But it's this is a general problem for the BPF Swift code, right? You just get back Ian Val and you have to guess mm -hmm. what's wrong. So yeah, but uh, for, for this for, for, for this part, particular case, I really like think that uh, like this way of just passing a macro, which will be just copied by other users, is really simpler than creating your own BTFs. Uh, for libraries, it's probably the same, right? For particular users, which just create, write like XDP or DC programs, it will be simpler to just copy five lines probably. Yeah, but so what are, what are the Go users and, and Rust users going to do? Okay. <laughs> Uh, going back to what David said, I think it would be interesting to compare this to the, I think you can implement this all with LPM right now. Even the port ranges, I think you can, if you do the like beep mask math, I think you can. So it will be more convincing if the next submission will have comparing this against LPM, array of LPMs, array of LPMs, array of LPMs. Um, yeah, for, for, for one thing with LPM is that you can only do this with one field, right? Yeah, you will have to have essentially like multiple array of LPMs going, I guess, like that. Maybe we can talk, I guess. On, on... Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you have like, I don't know, N fields, right? And each of them is implemented using LPM, you'll have N times logarithm lookup time, right? 
while here we just uh, like in, in many cases we can just uh, jump to like one two hash lookups it's it's way faster even for like yeah. one prefix it should be pretty easy to show that it's way faster i i think okay okay yeah yeah the the, the next thing for me is to like automate making this plots it's like semi automated right now i will uh, publish the test suite and self tests and stuff like this great Actually, historically speaking, this looks like the original FIB hash route lookup algorithm that we used to have in the IP. <laughs> like, 